Yeshua, my Savior. Yah, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty Here I am to worship, here I am 
to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Light of the Step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me.
Isabel Frances Ridley Hagergull. She wrote in 1874 when she was about 38 years old and it's take my life and let it be consecrated ya to thee. In this hymn, Frances is surrendering her whole self to Yahweh. She's saying, take my life and let it be consecrated to you, Yahweh. I dedicate my life to you. Take my feet, my voice, my lips, my money, my time, my intellect, my will, and make it yours, Yahweh. Take my heart, take my love, take myself, and I will be ever only for you. That's quite an amazing hymn. And it depicts the strength and heart and attitude and beauty of a life that is willingly surrendered to Yahweh. And my title today is The Journey of Surrender. And you know, surrender, you can have two types of surrender. One is where you have to give something up, you're forced. You don't want to, but you've got to. For example, during war, you know, the enemy has to give up their land when we won. <laughs> but that's not the kind of surrender I'm talking about today. The kind of surrender I'm talking about is when a believer completely gives up his or her own will, their own life, to Yahweh and submits to his thoughts, ideas, ways, word, teachings. That's the kind of surrender that I'm talking about today. So I'd like you to come on an adventure with me, yeah? Come on an adventure. Come on a journey and explore the journey of surrender through Naomi and Ruth. I'll set the scene. Ruth chapter one, verse one and two, it says, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his sons, two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his sons were Marlon and Chilion, Ephraimites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. And this is where we join. You've got to use your imagination here. I want you to really come on this journey with me. This is where we join Naomi. There she is in Moab with her husband and two sons because in Bethlehem there was no food, so they came to Moab. And Moab was a place, I want you to get this, imagine this, it was a place that did not worship Yahweh. They had their own God and his name was Chemosh, and which most likely means destroyer, subduer, or fish god. So that family was surrounded with this, yet Naomi and her family still worshipped Yahweh. Their heart was dedicated to Yahweh, although surrounded by Chemosh and all the other gods, she never turned her back on Yahweh. That, that's quite an amazing thing. And she didn't turn to the gods of Moab. And I want to ask this question today. Do we remain faithful when we're surrounded by sin, by other gods, by distraction, by maybe the influences of people who want us to turn away from Yahweh? Do we remain faithful to him? Then one tragic day, Naomi's husband died. She was bereaved. It must have been really awful for her. And her sons grew, and Marlon married Ruth, and Chilion married Orpah. And they were married for about 10 years, and then something absolutely dreadful happened. Marlon and Chilean, they both died. Now I can't imagine 
how absolutely devastating that must have been for Naomi. She lost her husband, her two sons, and also for Ruth and Orpah who had lost their husbands. You know, Naomi is in this foreign land. She lost her family. Her family had died. But like I said before, throughout this, she served Yahweh and she must have taught Ruth and Orpah about Yahweh because they knew about the God of Israel, name was God, they knew about him. So she must have taught them about Yahweh. So here we have three ladies, widows in Moab. And Ruth chapter 1 verse 6 and 7 says, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that Yahweh had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. So now we heard, there's food in Judah. Yahweh has visited Judah. I'm going to go back. So she gets up with Ruth and Orpah and they gather up a few things. This was a major thing. There was being in one country to go to, to another. And I would imagine it was just a few things because I would think they had to walk there. It's likely that they had to walk. And if we look at Ruth and Naomi and Ruth and Orpah at this time, they looked exactly the same. They both got up, they both left Moab, and they were on their way to Bethlehem with Naomi. And I want to say to you today that that road wasn't an easy road. It wasn't a smooth, nice country stroll. It was mountainous. If you've ever been to Israel, you'll see that parts of it is is mountainous and it's steep terrain. So they got up and then on this journey, Naomi suddenly stopped. They were walking along this rugged environment and Naomi turns to Ruth and Orpah and says, return home to your mother's house, your father's house. Go back to your family. Naomi gave her blessing for them to return. But how did they react? They both cried out and wept and says, No, we are coming with you, Naomi. We're coming with you. And again, from the outside, Ruth and Orpah still looked the same. Didn't they? They looked the same. But then came the crunch. Naomi was persistent. And she said, look, my daughter, I'm old. And if I was to get married today and have children, would you wait for them to grow up so that you could marry them? Come on, I'm old. That's, I'm too old. And it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of Yahweh has gone out against me. Because that's what Naomi thought. She's like, go back, go back. So there came the point when both of them had to make a decision individually. It wasn't the collective decision that they'd made previously, but now they had to make an individual decision. And that choice would determine the direction of their lives. And in that moment, it came to light that these two young widows were not the same. They look the same on the outside, you know, previously, their behaviour, but now they weren't the same. Orpah turned back to her gods and her family and her country. She loved Naomi, yet she didn't love her enough to go with her. She turned back and went to her gods and her country. She started out but when she was pressed, she turned back to her old way of life. She surrendered to her own desire 
to give up her way of life was too much for her. It was too much to ask. There was movement for Orpa, but she wasn't going forward. She was going backward. She went backwards. And you know, this reminds me of the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19. The rich young ruler came to Yeshua. He says, what must I do to have eternal life? And Yeshua says, well, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And the young man says, well, which ones? And Yeshua told him. And he says, well, I've kept them since I was young. What do I lack? And Yeshua said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come. Follow me. In verse 22, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. It was too much for him. He struggled to give up his wealth and lay it down at Yeshua's feet, give it to the poor. Both Orpah and the rich young ruler turned away. Orpah turned away from Naomi and ultimately Yahweh, and the rich young ruler turned away from Yeshua. And some people come short of salvation because they cannot find it in their hearts to forsake other things for Yeshua. Some people even love Yeshua, but they don't love him enough to give up their own will and their own desire and they leave him and it's tragic because they love other things better. You know the decision they make is not in line with the will of Yahweh for their lives when they turn their back on Yeshua. And I want to ask this question today, are you willing to surrender your life to Yeshua? Are the decisions that you make, are they in line with the will of Yahweh? Are they what Yahweh wants for you? We can't see the whole picture. We can never see the whole picture. But as we journey along, Yahweh speaks to us and shows us what we should do, where we should go, how we should behave. You know, these decisions, they will determine the direction of your life. Two people can look the same on the outside. But what is going on inside is completely different. One surrenders to Yeshua and follows him, and the other says it's too much and turns back to their old way of life and they move backwards. So what about Ruth? Now it was Ruth's turn. We're back on the journey to make the decision would she go back to her family, her gods, her, like her sister-in-law did? Or would she go with Naomi? And I want us to understand how big this decision was. Ruth was a Moabite, she was from Moab. And it meant leaving her family behind. Moving away from her own country to another country leaving the gods behind that maybe she was familiar with. She didn't know her future. She didn't know that she would ever get married again. She didn't know that she would ever have any children. It was a big decision, very big decision. And in Ruth 1 verse 16 and 17, it says this, but Ruth said, and that was, this is to Naomi, and treat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. Yahweh do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. Wow. Ruth was willing to do whatever it took. Whatever it took, she was willing. She surrendered all. 
She made a choice in line with Yahweh's will for her life. She was yet to find that out, but it was smack bang in line with Yahweh's will for her life. To follow Naomi, to follow the God of Naomi, Yahweh, to go where Naomi's people were. She left her family, her own country. She moved forward on the journey of surrender. Quite literally, she moved from one place to another. Couldn't have been an easy decision for Ruth. But she chose Yahweh in his will. And it's the same for us. There comes a time when a child or a young person or a man or woman, adults, where they have a choice to make. Do I recognise that I am a sinner and need to repent and turn from my old way of life and make Yeshua Lord of my life? To surrender to him? Do I recognise that? Am I willing to make that choice? You know, it's not a little prayer and carry on the same way as I always have. It's a total change of direction. It's a giving up of my own will to follow his will. It's a changing of masters. I stop serving Satan and I serve Yahweh. It's a total change. Ruth did whatever it took. Will you? Will I? You know, it could mean that you move, quite literally. I, if you could tell from my accent, although it's a bit muddled up, <laughs> come from Ellsbury in Buckinghamshire, southeast of England. And I live in the northeast of England. That's a long, long way from Halsbury. <laughs> and why do I live here? Because when I was 20, because I surrendered my life to you, I was a small child. And when I was 20, I left my home and my family. And I moved where Yahweh wanted me to be. And I ended up in the northeast of England. And you know, the amazing thing is, that many years later, my family moved up here as well. <laughs> but I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know that was going to happen. You know, Luke chapter 9, it says, Then he said to them all, this is Yeshua speaking, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. This is serious. If you decide to reject, ignore Yahweh, to live for yourself, ultimately, you will live eternally in torment, separated from him. You know, I was watching a film and there was a trailer for another film and it made a mockery of hell. This is how that affects me. Because the trailer was like, oh, where are you? I'm in hell. Oh, are you okay? Yeah, I'm having a great time. That is a lie. That's an absolute lie. It's not a great place to be. It's an awful, awful place to end up. But you know, the great thing is, is that Yahweh doesn't want any of us to go there. And he has made the way, if we choose it, that we don't have to go there. You know, Romans 10 verse 9 says, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Yeshua and believe in your heart that Yahweh raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It's made the way, hallelujah. We need to take up your cross. Follow Yeshua. That means dying to my own desires, my own attitudes, my own actions, and choose Yahweh's way, not my way. 
following his ways, following his word. Making up your mind, getting off the fence. You know if you're on the fence, some people are on the fence. They love Yeshua, they want to serve him, but they haven't quite surrendered. So one foot is on one side, the other foot is the other side. And they're thrown about because if they're influenced by people who want to do things that Yahweh doesn't want us to do, they do them. And then when they're with believers, they do do that. <coughs> You know, you, it doesn't only cause uncertainty for his, yourself, but it causes uncertainty for everybody else. They don't know if you can be reliable. They don't know if you can be depended on. If you haven't truly surrendered, you're fighting fires. You're fighting fires because you will fall into temptation. It's sinking sand. You know, Yahweh needs men and women that he can count upon. You know, we say all or nothing. I don't want the nothing. Let's give out all. All, 100%. Let's continue on our journey with Naomi and Ruth. So it was just the two of them. They were moving forward. Their journey was full of loads of decisions and choices. And you know, once a person has made the initial decision to surrender to Yahweh and Yeshua, there will be choices and decisions to be made along the way. And, but remember, we have the Holy Spirit. We, we're not doing this in our own strength. We have the Holy Spirit to lead us, empower us, direct us. And that's why I call the title of this message, The Journey of Surrender. Because surrender, I believe, is an ongoing process, it's an ongoing journey, and at certain points in your journey with Yahweh, that initial decision to surrender will be tested. Ruth chapter 1, verse, the start of verse 19. It says, Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And here's a map of where Moab is and where Bethlehem is. And here's maybe the way that they went. And like I said before, it was probably by, by foot, walking through a mountainous strip of the land of Jordan. And you can imagine Ruth and Naomi with some few bags on their back and walking, rugged, steep, hard, 50 miles of steep terrain. And although today it's a short journey back there, it probably would have taken them seven to 10 days. And I was thinking about Naomi. How was Naomi feeling on this journey. She'd been faithfully worshipping Yahweh. She must have told her daughters-in-law about him. She was sad. She was sad, and how do I know that? Because life for her at that time was very difficult. And we know this because when she reached Bethlehem, people were saying, hello, hello Naomi, it's so lovely to see you. She says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly, bitterly with me. I went out full and Yahweh has brought me home again empty. The Almighty has afflicted me. And I can imagine Naomi as she was walking back to Bethlehem. You know, when you go back home, you don't like to go back empty, do you? You like to show how successful you are. You don't want to go back empty. But she was going back home, her husband, her husband had died, her sons had died, and um, Ruth was with her, but she was going back empty. And she felt like Yai was against her, but Yai was not against her, he was with her, even at the very, very difficult time. But she never, and I keep saying this, she never turned her back on Yahweh, 
And although she didn't understand, she still must have trusted Yahweh. And here was a woman who was broken. She was broken. And she was returning from a foreign land. And she seemed like an unlikely prospect for any role in Yahweh's covenant of redemption. Yet Naomi was right at the centre of Yahweh's will for her life, and so was Ruth. And at points on the journey of surrender for us, it can be difficult, and maybe we don't understand. Not an easy place. The road can be steep and dry, and painful and lonely. And we could lose our foot in a bit and maybe make mistakes, get out of breath, get dusty, get sweaty. It's not plain sailing. And you might think, am I really in the will of Yahweh right now? But you know, if you're surrendering your life to Yahweh, then yes, you are. Even though it might be tough, you are. And he knows what he's doing. And it reminds me of Yeshua. He came to the point, well, he was surrendered, wasn't he? Yeshua was surrendered. But he came to the point in the Garden of Gethsemane where he came to the foot of the mountain of Calvary. And in Luke 22, 41 to 44, it says, And he was withdrawn from them, that's Yeshua, about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Well, he was at the foot of the mountain of Calvary of crucifixion. He knew that he was going to endure such pain, whipping. Nails were going to be put in his hands and his feet. A crown of thorns was going to be pushed into his head. He was going to be mocked, tormented, in anguish, forsaken, dying the most cruel death, yet he chose Yahweh's will. You know, Yeshua died to self and then he died for others. And hallelujah, he rose again victorious three days later. Hallelujah, he rose again. So that you and I can come and know him and have eternity with him and surrender ourselves to him and do the will of Yahweh but to have eternal life. Some things in our lives may be harder to surrender than others. In my experience there's always that one thing that seems bigger than everything else. You know. Yahweh, yeah, I'll give you this, I'll give you this, I'll give you this, and I'll give you this, but not that, no, please, not that. That's too big. Maybe it's too, too precious to surrender that part of your life to Yahweh, and it can seem really steep and difficult. And although it won't be easy, you know it's possible. It is possible to surrender it to Yahweh. And I concluded that fighting Yahweh and trying to keep things back from him just takes up a lot of energy. <laughs> and if you're fighting, you're not moving forward. Because you're fighting, you're not moving forward. You know, and I want to say today, and this is from my own personal experience, that we have a Heavenly Father who wants the best for us. He knows us and he knows you better than you know you. 
He knows what his perfect plan for your life is, whatever stage you're at in life. You're in the palm of his hand. He can be trusted. He can be trusted. So let go. Let go and give it to him. In my experience, although not easy, a surrender brings a settledness and a peace and a confidence and a protection that you're in the hands of someone, Yahweh, who is much bigger and greater and more powerful and more resourceful than yourself. He knows what's best. And he may give it back to you. He may not. But he can be trusted. And I want to bring balance today to show that although the act of surrender can be very difficult, it will produce good fruit in your life and Yahweh's blessing. So there is a balance. There is a balance here. And let's pick up on Naomi and Ruth's journey again. After that mountainous journey, Naomi and Ruth reached Bethlehem where they received a warm welcome. People were so excited to see Naomi again. It was the beginning of the harvest, barley harvest, and I can imagine Naomi and Ruth having somewhere to live. Maybe it was the home that was Ruth, um, Naomi's when she was there before, I don't know. But they would have settled down a bit. But they had no husbands to provide for them. And Ruth set her mind that she was going to go glean in and she was going to provide for Naomi and herself. So in Ruth chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, it says, There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. So Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favour. And she said to her, go my daughter. So what's gleaning? When wheat and barley fields ready to be harvested, some of the grain is allowed to fall to the ground for the poor, the widow, the foreigner, the orphan. And the corners of the field weren't harvested for the same reason so that the poor, the widow, the foreigner, the orphan could have grain so they could have food and resource and they could eat. So this is what Naomi and Ruth was going to do, going to go and glean, follow the harvesters and glean. And from my research, brief research, I believe the barley harvest is around Passover time-ish. I'm saying ish, don't come back to me please, ish, April-ish. <laughs> And the temperatures were probably 15 to 20 degrees, which is warm-ish. <laughs> you can imagine, you know, it was warm-ish. And Ruth was gleaning in, just happened to be Boaz's field. No, it didn't so happen. There's no coincidences with the other. It was the eyes perfect plan. She was a devoted woman, and each decision she made, she was going in the way that Yahweh had ordained for her to go in. And there she was picking up the grain for her and Naomi, and Boaz spoke to her. And you know Boaz, he was a really wealthy man. He had lots of people working for him, and Ruth caught his attention. And in Ruth 2, 8 to 10, it says, Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Have I not commanded that the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favour in your eyes? that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth 
and have come to a people who you did not know before. You know, not only did Ruth's work produce fruit in that she picked up the grain and her Naomi could eat, she was blessed. She was protected by Boaz. She was safe there. She had water when she was thirsty. He gave her special attention. He gave provisions and the, the leftover sheaves should be put on the ground so that Ruth could pick them up. Plus, if you think about her personality, when I think about this woman, her personality, her character bore good fruit. I, would, I think she was an, um, a woman of unfailing devotion, humility, respect, honesty, integrity, compassion, kindness, and the list could go on. And as she journeyed along, she would have grown in maturity because as you surrender to Yahweh and as you walk forward with him, you have to grow. It's natural. It's a natural thing. And um, you bear good fruit. It's a natural thing that you bear good fruit. And I, I ask the question, what about me? What about you? What fruit has been produced in your life and in my life? You know, the child, young person, man or woman who surrenders their life and will to Yahweh will bear fruit and will change from the inside out. Colossians 3 verse 8 says, But now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. In verse 12, Therefore, as the elect of Yahweh, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Messiah forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And like I said before, a surrendered life produces good fruit. And I got this from Christianity.com and I thought it was really good and I'm just going to read it. It says, to those who believe in Yeshua Messiah, the subsequent response to salvation is obedience. Those who believe in Yahweh choose to obey his commands and willingly forsake their former sinful ways. As one submits to Yahweh, their hearts are changed. Their desires begin to mirror his desires and their deeds reflect his heart for the world. Deeds are the outer reflection of the inner transformation they are the evidence of a heart that has been and is continually being transformed and renewed by Yahweh. May we surrender to Yahweh. May I surrender to Yahweh that we will produce good fruit in our lives, in our words, in our action, in our behaviour, in our attitude. You know, getting back on our journey to Boaz and Ruth, in verse 12, Boaz said a profound thing, and this really hit home to me. He said to Ruth, Yahweh repay your work, and a full reward be given you by Yahweh, God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. What a prayer. May Yahweh repay your work and a full reward. That means a perfect, a whole a peaceable reward, wages, be given you by Yahweh, God of Israel, under whose wings Yahweh spread his wings over Ruth. You have come for refuge. She came, she trusted in him, she hoped in Yahweh. How awesome is that? And you know the thing that makes me smile is at that time, I don't think Boaz realised 
that he was going to be the instrument that Yahweh was going to use to fulfill that prayer. But he did, didn't he? <laughs> and I want to say today to those of you who have surrendered your life to Yahweh for many, many years, who have been on this journey of surrender, who have given up yourself, your time, your energy, your money, everything, following Yahweh, and you're still faithfully surrendering and following Him. I want to say to you today, may Yahweh repay your work and a full reward be given you by Yahweh God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Hallelujah. May Yahweh do that for you. How blessed was Ruth when she initially made that decision on that mountainous terrain, steep, steep mountains, travelling to Bethlehem, she surrendered everything. She didn't know if she'd get married again, she didn't know whether she would have children, yet Yahweh gave her Boaz as her husband. And she became a woman of substance. She inherited lands and possessions. They had a son called Obed. And you know, I think of Naomi, Grandma Naomi. Obed must have brought such joy to Naomi. You know, the Bible says, weeping may enjoy for a night, but joy comes in the morning. There must have been such joy for, Na for Grandma Naomi. <laughs> And you know, Obed, when he grew up, he had a son called Jesse, who had a son called David, who was King David, who was of the line of the Messiah. You know, wow, the reward of Ruth's devotion far transcends local time and circumstances. It went all into the future. She was of the line of Yeshua the Messiah. You know, Naomi and Ruth surrendered and in doing so kept walking forward in Yahweh's perfect plan and his perfect plan was produced in their lives. And I want to say today that yes, the Bible says we will have persecutions and we do and we will. And life can be tough and surrendering can be painful, but hand in hand with that, if we keep Travelling forward, we will produce good fruit and Yahweh will bless us, he will protect us and he will provide for us. And it goes, transcends local time and circumstances, it propels us into the future, eternal life with him. You know, I think of Yah's provision and his protection and I can personally say that on numerous occasions Yahweh has protected me. Literally from being killed, he has protected me. On numerous occasions, Yahweh has provided for me. When people said, no, that can't happen, it's happened because Yahweh has made it happen. Yahweh has provided for me. It is it's amazing. <laughs> his blessing and his provision and it's amazing. And I would like to finish today in conclusion, and I want to ask this question. Have you surrendered to Yahweh? Have you come to the place where you've decided to make a decision to surrender everything to Yahweh? To come off the fence, to take up your cross daily and follow him wherever he leads to surrender your will, your ambitions, your desire, your purpose. Do you need to surrender for the first time today? Or maybe you need to surrender afresh. You know, now is not the time to say, I've done my time, I've served you for years, I'm getting older now, it's my time, me, it's for me. I, I'm going to do what I want to do now, it's for me. No, it's not. It's not the time to do that. It's certainly not the time to do that in the day and age that we live. Neither is it the time if you're young to think, well, I'll surrender when I'm in my 40s, 50s. Because to young people that seems a long way away when it's not really. But 
No, it's not the time to put off giving your life to Yahweh. You know, it's time to live. It's time to move forward. It's time to give all. It's time to come off the fence. It's time to count the cost. It's time to take up your cross and follow your commander and chief and move forward individually and move forward as a company of people united in purpose. It's time. Which brings me forward to the hymn that I began with today. Can you say with me, take my life and let it be consecrated, Yah to thee. Yah, bless you.